It is my sad duty to inform the House of the death of Mr. David Irvine, a member for the East Belfast constituency. In his East Belfast heartland tonight, the loss of David Irvine is felt most acutely. This area and its street politics shaped him, propelled him into terrorist activity and convinced him that the next generation should not follow such a path. January 2007 and the premature death of the former UVF paramilitary David Irvine brought the people of Northern Ireland together in grief in a way that would once have seemed unthinkable. Nothing befitted David more than his funeral. There you had present just about every aspect of political opinion in Northern Ireland, including Jerry Adams, because he had such respect for David. David Irvine's transformation from bomb maker to peacemaker, from a foot soldier blinded by revenge to a politician with a vision for peace, gave him a unique voice in Northern Irish politics, whose absence is still felt 30 years after the Loyalist ceasefire. Not forgetting, you know, his organization killed my mother. He said, I'm working night and day, all day, every day to make sure this never happens again. And it was at that moment I thought, maybe I'm in the presence of somebody a bit special here. I don't think you could live through the violence and be part of that violence and not be troubled. I don't think you can't not remember. He was um, head and shoulders above most political leaders, frankly, in Britain, let alone in, uh, in Northern Ireland itself. Highly intelligent, articulate, gutsy, and a real nice guy. Here, for the first time, was a politician saying, this is an awful place. We can make it better. I was part of that awfulness. I know that we can make it better. The conveyor belt has begun, which is unstoppable. The people of Northern Ireland will have peace. We will have dark days. It just means that we have to work harder and harder and harder. We need, collectively, to say the war is over. He was doing the right thing, and, uh, and you have to welcome that. He talked about lusting for peace, and I used to look at him and say, David, do you know what that word lust means? He said, you're the only man in this world that'll get away with using the term lust. And I thought, what a fantastic way of putting it, because that's what he did. In the shadow of the Harland and Wolf shipyards, David Irvine grew up in a terraced house on Chamberlain Street in a Protestant working class area of East Belfast. The youngest of five children born to Elizabeth and Walter Irvine in 1953, their socialist father was a shipyard worker who'd served in the Royal Navy. We were Presbyterians and uh, we had a church at the end of our street, a Presbyterian church. And whilst I think my father was quite atheistic, he felt it very important that he point out the radicalism that existed within the Protestant community and that was suppressed by sectarianism. I personally am grateful to my father because my, dad, my father always acted devil's advocate. Had you taken a particular position, political position or any sort of position, my dad would have deliberately taken the opposite position. Why do you believe that? That's nonsense, what about that? So he made you fight your corner he made you think about what you were saying. He did it with both of us. And he, and he also made us say, well, it ain't necessarily so. There's another side. There's always another side. There's always another viewpoint. Don't swallow everything, son, you know. Walter Irvine's determination to see both sides of every argument turned him against the hardline tribal certainties of Northern Ireland. Well, my father was, in truth, sickened by politics in Northern Ireland. And I remember Paisley uh, campaigning in our street and then my dad in language that was shocking to me told Paisley to fuck off. So my father was a very literate man and he was also um, a liberal man. My, my mother was about, you know, just, uh, just right of Genghis Khan, you know, in her politics. <laughs> She was a red-hot unionist, a red-hot unionist lady, but her heart was kind. She was a kind soul. I remember she talked about, you know, about the Republicans and, the, you know, and this. But two guys called to see me from, from Cork, took them in, 
fed them for a couple of days, right? And away it went again. And that was ahead of the troubles too. It was a pretty interesting upbringing. I mean, I, it was full of discussion, full of debate. My mother shouted and my father talked. David left school at 15 and worked successively in an engineering works as a storeman and as a shop assistant to a Catholic employer. At age 16, he met his future wife, Jeanette Cunningham. Jeanette was a very, very, a very good looking girl and very talented. And she played guitar and sang. I mean, what, what could a man do? Like, what could a man do? <laughs> so David fell hook, line and singer. We were only going out for the matter of weeks. And David said, I'm going to marry you. And I said, you're mad, your head's cut. You don't even know me. And well, anyway, we ended up, we did marry, 1972. I was 18 when I got married. And I have to say, we all look at life in hindsight. Wisest, sensiblest thing I ever did. Um, and I mean that. Um, lucky. David's teenage years saw the civil rights campaign and an eruption of violence in Northern Ireland, bringing the British Army onto the streets and prompting the formation of new hardline paramilitary forces on both sides of the political and sectarian divide. The 70s sort of changed everything. It was like somebody nearly pulled a black curtain over the whole of Belfast, it completely, totally and absolutely changed in a very, very short space of time. By the time David married his teenage sweetheart, Jeanette, bombings by the new provisional IRA were bringing terror to the civilian population. It's 20 past three in the afternoon, and for the last 20 minutes, Belfast has been rocked by the biggest bombing offensive seen in the city this year. All over the city, plumes of smoke arose as the explosions took place. At this moment behind me, fires are raging in several buildings. I had avoided joining paramilitary organizations to that point. I was in a, an upstairs pub lounge, which had a reasonable view across Belfast. And I watched as the puffs of smoke went up. And it was only later, of course, that you realised that each of the puffs of smoke was uh, somebody's life. And uh, I got off the fence and uh, probably naively felt that the best means of defence was attack. In a community hall, not unlike this, I joined the UVF. I suppose in my mind then, it was the sense that if you're going to do this to me, I'm going to do it back. Or as has been quoted before, return to serve. I suppose maybe the impetuosity of youth encouraged me to believe that the best means of defence was attack. I now refute that, although, frankly, then, and it's not something that I enjoy talking about, but uh, then I, I, I didn't know what else to do. I remember going to East Belfast to meet somebody and uh, gave it was her, and we had a conversation then as well about whether it was right or whether it was wrong in terms of the conflict and in terms of what, what the UVF were doing. Uh, at that time, both of us were in agreement that there was no other option then, only to do where we were going. I was impressed with David when I talked to him at the start, you know, his commitment, uh, particularly to UVF and uh, particularly to those people who were in charge of UVF back then. Uh, he had a big commitment to them because he, he believed that they were going to do the right thing and go in the right direction. As paramilitary violence escalated, David Irvine became an active member of the UVF, one of many trained in the use of weapons and explosives. The shooting of Catholic civilians and the bombing of Catholic bars without warning became a UVF hallmark. On the 2nd of May 1974, UVF paramilitaries threw a bomb through the door of the Rose and Crown Bar on Belfast's Lower Ormo Road, killing six Catholics, including 59-year-old Jim Doherty. You know, I was seven at the time. My eldest sister was 21. It's, it fractured our family. There's big seams of, of unspoken tragedy. And uh, yeah, to this day, actually, to this day. 
when I became conscious of it as a, as a young teenager probably, I had anger, really palpable anger. The four guys who, who were found guilty and imprisoned for the bombing at the time, two of them were 16 and two of them were 17. I mean, they were, they were caught up in it as, as much as my father was, but I don't forgive the lads who, who did it because whilst they were only 16 and 17, they were able to think for themselves. Now, maybe they were under threat, but they were instructed by someone to go up the armour road and bomb a Catholic bar. And that's what they did. 16 days after the Rose and Crown killings, the UVF's bombing campaign climaxed when four car bombs exploded without warning in Dublin and Monaghan, killing 33 people, including a pregnant woman. That remains the single biggest loss of life of any event during the Troubles. There's no evidence that David Irvine was involved in either of those events, but later that year, he was stopped by the RUC while on an active bombing mission, driving a stolen car with five pounds of commercial explosives, a detonator and fuse wire in the boot. And David, when, he, when they were up ahead, he says, there's a bomb in it. And he says, if you want, I'll defuse it. So the tighter rope around him and he went in and he defused it. Well, I was arrested for possession of explosives with intent to endanger life, which I think is an accurate description. I certainly would have uh, created damage and, and would have willingly created damage. Yes, um, I would have killed him. I would have, without question. Prior to that, I didn't know that David had joined an organization. You know, it wasn't until just prior to him being arrested that I found out and oh, I pleaded with him. And for me, it wasn't the right thing to do. And what would happen if you got killed or you killed somebody? But that was around the time of Bloody Friday because a lot of young people who never ever would have been involved in trouble of any sort, with all those things happening, made the decision to join an organisation. Well, my wife uh, of two years was shocked to her foundations because, as I say, the Ulster Volunteer Force was a secret organisation. And whilst she knew I was staying out later than I normally would and was more out of the house more than I normally would, she didn't actually know for sure that I was a member of a paramilitary organisation. My son was uh, approaching the second birthday and, uh, when I was arrested and her life fell apart. She was absolutely devastated. David Irvine was sentenced to 11 years in prison and was sent to Long Kesh, which by this stage had become the main jail for both Republican and Loyalist paramilitaries. Mark would have said, Daddy, when are you coming home? And is it that big? And he would have measured with his hands because he was only an infant. And David said, no, a wee bit bigger. I had taken the action that I had taken. I had a young son and a young wife. And I felt that I had to take probably the biggest risk I was ever going to take and say, I got me into this. This is not your burden. Um, I'd like you to have your freedom. And thank God she said no. You offered a divorce? Yes. Uh, she was actually quite annoyed at that, but it wasn't romantic and it wasn't sentimental. I was doing it because I'd got me into the situation. And sometimes I think we, we don't realise that when we say me, that there's a, a wife, a son, a mother, brothers, sisters, all of those who so deeply care and are all affected by this. My father by this time had died. So my father didn't know anything about David, David's involvement you know, in, in the paramilitaries, which was a mercy because I think my dad would have been deeply disappointed and it might have really, really have hurt him. In Long Kesh, David met Gusty Spence, a founding member of the UVF who'd served in the British Army and was the UVF camp commanding officer. Spence ran the blocks like a prisoner of war camp. 
he quickly spotted leadership qualities in David Irvine, placing him in one of the UVF's three blocks, Compound 18, during a tense standoff with authorities over political status and autonomy for paramilitaries in the prison. Now you all talk about Davey being a big cuddly fella. Davey was in charge of the front row with his makeshift shield and his big iron bedstead baiting the daylights out of it, challenging the army to advance. Now the army commander appeared and got Gusty came out for a power. And between them they negotiated the truce. So at the end of the truce then the army done the about turn and marched back to the quarters. We done the about turn and marched back the compound 18 to the cheers of all the other loyalist compounds. I, mean, I served all over the world, the Royal Old Survivals, the Royal Irish Rangers, and I served alongside the Gurkhas in Malaya. That night as I marched the men back to Compound 18, it was probably one of the proudest nights of my military service. Gusty Spence was a hard man, but he was also a thinker, and besides military discipline, he constantly challenged his men to question everything, including themselves. When he said to me, and I entered Long Cash, he said, why are you here? I said, possession of explosives. He said, no, no, why are you here? I said, because I was caught. And he said, no, 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 why are you here? And that caused me a problem. Not in the sense that I couldn't answer it, or at least couldn't give an answer, but what lay behind that offered Spence the opportunity to ask question after question after question. Serial drill sergeant tactic, you know, new recruit comes, you knock them back on their heels, knock the cockiness out of them, and leave them totally confused, you know. I don't advocate that anybody goes to jail for reflection. <laughs> But believe me, Long Cash turned out to be a wonderful place to reflect. I mean, for me, I, I began to see things that I never imagined I'd see. I began to think in ways that I never imagined I'd think. And I was encouraged to do so by Gusty Spence, who probably at that point was the most arrogant bastard that I've ever met in my life. And I love this man, and he's made a difference in my life. But there were times that I avoided him because there was always a challenge. There was always a degree of provocation. What I wanted to do was to provoke them into thinking about why they were there, not defense. Defense was only the manifestation of why they were there. I wanted to know the reasons why they were there. I had one boy in one of my compounds and he still had a, sc a school blazer on and he had shot two people in the head and could not give a comprehensive, rational reason why he did it. But I think that question was the beginning of the unlocking of the door. And I would pay the respect to Gusty Spence, which is due, that for many of us, he unlocked the door. It was up to us whether we went through it or not. And thankfully, very thankfully, quite a number went through that door. David Irvine resigned from his leadership role in Compound 18 and moved to Spencer's own Compound 21, where the focus was on education and politics. Spence was developing a political philosophy, progressive unionism, which offered a socialist alternative to both mainstream unionism and loyalist violence. David Irvine became a keen student. And that thinking, I suppose, at that stage, that conflict can't go on forever that war doesn't go on forever and at some stage you've got to think your way out of it, you've got to talk your way out of it. And I suppose that talking began in, in Long Cash, well ahead of its time. Well, there was a number of us in Long Cash in, in that group and most of us were in the PVP whenever we came out. And we were looking at things that were going on outside, we were reading papers from people on the outside and we were responding to them and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a good piece of work. You can see that those conversations were a couple of decades before their time, in many senses. It took a while for all of that to, to filter through to, to others. But, but I, I think there is no doubt that the early conversations, the early exploration, if you like, of the potential for peace began in, in those unlikely circumstances, if you like, in that unlikely place of, of, of jail. David often used to say, 
and I agree with him. It was toxic politics and toxic religion that actually shaped this space. That's not condoning what David did, but sometimes politicians and religious leaders need to also ask the question. I mean, another senior UVF figure said to me, I heard a clergy person who will be nameless, but all this thing can guess who it was. I say, if they don't behave themselves in the South, it will be shots across the border. And he said, after I heard him, Gary, it'll let a fire within me. Now, I teased him and said, I'm not saying his name, I said, well, it wasn't the fire of the Holy Spirit, it was the fire of religious sectarianism, because he ended up murdering two Catholics, which I would categorically say was wrong, but a kid at 16, 17 years of age was being cleverly manipulated by so-called religious leaders in this space in the 70s. Daly was another one. Our house was bombed in November 1983, and the bomber blew himself up. His name was David Maitland, uh, who was, uh, he had lost his arm and his leg and his, his, his it, was, it was just a terrible, a terrible sight. What, he, I, what I remember more than anything was he looked up at me and said, don't kill me, mister. And if I ever saw or ever felt I was looking at a victim, he, like everybody up here, was a victim of the hatred that the society was for 50 years. Um, not rotten to the core, but rotten from the core. Jude White's Catholic family lived on University Street in Belfast. The UVF targeted their home again as both parents were associated with the Alliance Party. They returned and put a bomb at the front of the house this time. And my mother was walking into the house, saw a um, a bag, phoned the police. The police were there within two minutes. Mum went to the door, the policeman walked up the alleyway, the bomb went off. The policeman, Michael, Constable Michael Dawson, 21 year old from the brand new estate over in East Belfast, and Mum died instantly. So the policeman shone his torch, and I was blowing up the stairs. My wife was fell where she was standing, just inside the door. This can destroy people. If you if you want revenge, uh, dig two graves. There's and put. I mean, after you kill the person you want revenge on, then just kill yourself because it corrodes your soul, it corrodes your spirit. There was I can think of four or five people in that area I lived were all murdered, were all killed for one simple reason. They were Catholics. They were unarmed. They were civilian, and they were in nothing but a bar at the wrong time or going through their front door. For me, it wasn't about individuals. It wasn't about trying to create circumstances where we would win. We were trying to stem what we perceive was a siege and the encroachment and the killing and the maiming of my community. And we wanted to end that and believed, as I've said, that the best means of defense was attack. Of course, that's not what I would uh, suggest now. But it's, I suppose when I met, uh, started meeting loyalist paramilitary leaders, who I'd always regarded as gangsters, basically, that, I mean, one or two would have explained um, that they got involved bec because they wanted to defeat the IRA. And when you ask them, how does killing unarmed civilians defeat the IRA, they would say something along the lines that it would terrify that community into making the IRA stop its campaign. And I mean, the naivety of that is nearly, is nearly beyond belief in that in the 70s, the 60s, the 70s, right into the early 80s, the IRA had absolutely no interest in electioning whatsoever and public opinion meant virtually nothing. And they had a very, very strong base within the Republican community to continue the violence. So could I ever hate somebody enough to put a bomb in their bar because they're all Protestants? Nah, I couldn't. But I could hate them. I don't, I'm, no, I'm under no illusions about that. We're all part of this because in many respects, we were made who we are. 
David Irvine was released from Longkesh after five and a half years on the 2nd of May 1980. He joined and would subsequently lead the Progressive Unionist Party. The UVF created a kitchen cabinet where members of the PUP and paramilitary leaders met twice weekly to discuss the movement's policy and strategy. As a former paramilitary turned politician, David's role was crucial. That was about, uh, you know, how you would sell this to the volunteers and stuff like that. But, you know, they were very academic papers, obviously. Uh, but it was about how do you actually sell this to people on the outside in terms of the volunteers. The, the thing about David is that he, he articulates well, he speaks well, and he's uh, articulating a challenging point of view. This is, it seems to me, is the freshness of, of what he says, that no longer is he asking people to follow slogans? He's asking people to think, and he's asking people to make choices. And I think that he presents challenges all over this island, and that's, I think, the benefit. It was clear that for some loyalists, the transition from paramilitary tactics to political ones would be a hard sell, especially if it involved disowning their own past actions. All of them. They had adopted with, what I sarcastically called ideologically born again loyalism. It wasn't really me. That couldn't have been me all those years ago. I mean, I'm a good guy. I would never have done that. I, I was in the boys' brigade. I went to Sunday school. Sooner or later, you'll find somebody else to blame or something else to blame for your actions. Anything other than take responsibility for your own actions. We took up arms in defence of the democratic right of the people of Northern Ireland to decide their own faith, nationality and destiny in the face of an IRA onslaught and treachery from the British government. I still believe fundamentally, absolutely, in Northern Ireland's best interest being within the multicultural democracy that is the United Kingdom. But it began uh, in me a questioning process of the structures of our society. I haven't experienced childbirth, but the most ex painful experience that I have in life is self-analysis. Why did I do what I do? And uh, examination of, of what I harboured in my heart, uh, I suppose, is part of my politics. But I can remember saying to both my children, as they reach the heady age of 15 years, when someone says something to you, ask, why did they say that? I'm not trying to uh, encourage cynicism, but I am trying to encourage questioning. Questioning leads to exploration. Exploration sometimes leads to answers. And we have a society where simple things said cost people's lives. In the early 1980s, David was introduced to trade unionist and Christian minister, Chris Hudson, who became an important intermediary between the UVF and the Irish government. Irvine immediately showed he was receptive to Hudson's message of non-violence. Uh, David was speaking at an event in Dublin and he was speaking as a community worker from Belfast, allegedly. And I was introduced to him, and a person whispered in my ear as I leaned across to shake Davy's hand, he's really UVF. And I was explaining to Davy my hostility to all paramilitary organizations. So Davy said to me, well, would you like an opportunity to speak to these people? I said, absolutely. So I went up and I had a more deeper conversation with the number two of the UVF who was really, in my opinion, was the architect, really, of the Loyalist ceasefire. I always think Davy was the narrator of the Loyalist ceasefire. He was, he created uh, the atmosphere for it. People think of Loyalism as, you know, rednecks dragging their knuckles along the ground. The, David Irvine and the number two of the UVF and others were far from that. And also I had to confirm for them that the Irish government had no hidden agenda. In other words, that the main aspect of the Irish government's involvement in this was to try and help deliver a 
peace process in Northern Ireland, which would treat both communities in a fair way. And I, I'm happy to say that David Irvine in particular was able to grasp that quicker than many other people, which was essential. The Shankill Road was crowded with the usual Saturday lunchtime shoppers. The bomb exploded without warning. It ripped through the fishmonger's shop and the building on either side. Six people died instantly. The final death toll has not yet been established. It was a period of time which was an awful period here after the Shankill bomb, between the Shankill bomb and, and October 93 and the ceasefires the next October. Uh, after the Shankill bomb, there was this uh, period of time when things were like spiraling out of control, you know, grey steel and, and a whole subsequent awful number of acts. And there was a number of us at a community level that were appealing for no retaliation uh, from loyalist paramilitaries. And we were meeting them all in various times uh, in the month after the Shankill bomb. I remember David phoned me and uh, I said, look, I can't continue in this role. And he said, both of us have to be able to ignore what's happening on the street and we keep involved in this. So when I was being interviewed by Pat Kenny, if I recollect what I said was that I was meeting with people who were close to and knew the understanding of loyalist paramilitaries. And I said they speak with honeyed words, but we still see dastardly murderous deeds. And I said, I often have to question whether there's any value in continuing those talks. Everybody in Lochin Island would know the six men who died. Many have been overcome by the horror of it all. Last night, 24 people were in the bar watching the match. Two UVF gunmen came in and sprayed them with automatic fire. In a matter of seconds, five men lay dead. A sixth died afterwards. That for me was one of the worst days of my life. You know, on the cusp of something wonderful, when horror strikes, it was devastating because it was, in my mind, and certainly in the minds of others, was we'd lost everything that all the efforts that had been put in were in vain. Because it, expressly it was it was carried out by the UVF. And I thought that that meant everything was over. There was no chance of ceasefire. There was no chance of a proper exploration of the future. And thankfully I was wrong. And yet, you know, you sound so callous when you say it in simplistic terms like that. I, I think as we arrive in that period where people are seriously talking about ceasefires, but before the announced ceasefires of, of 1994, the IRAs in August, the, the Loyalist ceasefire in October, Loyalists had been exploring the prospect and the possibility of going first. So they give a, a private statement to the then Church of Ireland Archbishop, uh, Robin Eames, to share with John Major and Albert Reynolds. And basically it was the terms that Loyalists would want met. And if they were met, uh, then they were prepared to go ahead of the IRA and announce their ceasefire first. In 1994, after 25 years of the Troubles, the IRA called it ceasefire on the 31st of August. Less than two months later, the Combined Loyalist Military Command followed suit, announcing its ceasefire on the 13th of October. The Combined Loyalist Military Command will universally cease all operational hostilities as from 12 midnight on Thursday the 13th of October 1994. <clears throat> the permanence of our ceasefire will be completely dependent upon the continued cessation of all nationalist republican violence. The sole responsibility for a return to war lies with them. In all sincerity, in all sincerity, we offer to the loved ones of all innocent victims over the past 25 years abject yeah. and true remorse. No words of ours will compensate for the intolerable suffering they have undergone during this conflict. 
Let us firmly resolve, therefore, to respect our differing views of freedom, culture and aspiration, and never again permit our political circumstances to degenerate into bloody warfare. And people like me breathed. We breathed. So all of that relief was there. And then, the, you know, the tentative steps. And without the lake of Adams and Irvine, it wouldn't have happened. And in my view, these were big pressures on these people and they were fighting in many respects against hundreds of years to take the gun out of Irish politics. So honestly, you would need to be a very cynical, sad individual to not welcome what happened there in 1984. I don't think without him uh, and the late Costi Spence, loyalists could have been controlled. And he was the, he was a shining light at that time, you know. Is here is the epitome of hope for all the traditions on the island of Ireland and indeed within the British Isles, where the protagonists who did make statements that the violence had ended, here surely is the hope where people can, without weaponry, transform our society into a political society. Look at that 95, 6, like to be able to stand out um, against uh, the, 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 the great Reverend Ian Pacey, you know, and to be able to articulate a different line and being able to get people on your side um, and say, no, there's another way around this. Like that, 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 was fair, that was a fair achievement. We're in difficult and dangerous times and to sit on your hands and do nothing is shameful. I mean, there's one incident that I really remember very well, which was a negotiation, I think it was at Western Park. And uh, Jerry Adams had reverted to this issue of the causes of the conflict. And Davy, who had this really sharp mind, focused straight in on that. He said, are you saying that the IRA will not end the conflict until the causes of the conflict have been met? And do you mean by that a united Ireland, or do you mean by that meeting the Good Friday Agreement? And that was a question Jerry Adams couldn't answer because of the constitution of the IRA, which said couldn't give up your weapons till there's united Ireland. So he tried dodging it every way he could. I mean, Jerry was very good at dancing around the head of a pin in an interview. But Davy wasn't having any of it. He kept pressing it home. He kept pressing it home. And eventually he walked out. But it always stuck with me because he, unlike most people in those negotiations, he went straight to the, the real issue. I think it helped because it meant Adams had to get off this hook of the ambiguity about when they were ending the conflict. Just over half an hour ago, George Mitchell rose to announce that two and a half years of talks had ended in success. David Irvine's efforts to lead loyalist factions into a safe and lasting resolution came to fruition on Good Friday 1998, when a deal was struck committing all parties to peaceful democratic politics. It's about recognising the need to encompass all attitudes and all opinions, all religions, all creeds, all colours, sexes, disabilities, within a diverse and honourable society, that which my society has never been. Ratified by overwhelming majorities north and south of the border, the Belfast Agreement introduced power-sharing self-government by the people of Northern Ireland. But the largest unionist party, the DUP, remained unconvinced, and David Irvine saw there was still critical work to be done to make peace permanent. He was really great at thinking things through and doing it in a way that he could... It was nearly like he was looking at a model on a board. He used to call it sitting on the balcony, and he, he would say to me all the time, get up above, look down at all the pieces, look at all the models, look at who's dancing and who's not. So ask yourself why they're not dancing, why they're not engaging. So it was always this strategic thinking. When I came to be the Chief Commissioner for Human Rights, they were the only people who were speaking up and had no difficulty speaking up about the need for these rights. And that took the sting away from this being a kind of nationalist unionist thing. It took the sting out of, you know, the notion that it was all a legacy of the civil rights. What they were doing was bringing class politics into this. Here for the first time was a politician saying, this is an awful place, we can make it better. I was part of that awfulness. I know that we can make it better, but we need to do it together and we need to involve everyone in doing that. You know, from the poorest in our community to the richest in our community, to the most disadvantaged, to the most privileged, we have got to work together to make this a better place.
Nothing beyond death will deflect me and the political party that I belong to because I'm not in splendid isolation from uh, evaluating the opportunities and exploring the future. He had far more vision for the future, I think, than other unionist politicians. Uh, but that, of course, came with a price. Uh, and so he was criticised. He was crit criticised by his own people. Um, uh, he was criticised as being as being too radical, as being a traitor. Um, uh, and, and considerable pressure came with that. And I know that took a toll on him. I have a car, he says, but I don't, uh, I never use the car. He says, why don't you drive? He says, I'm afraid of getting whacked. He says, the Provies wouldn't whack you in a million years, so they all love you. He says, well, it's not the Provies I'm worried about, he says, it's my own people. And I can remember thinking, like, that's, that's a big threat to live under. By 2006, that pressure was beginning to take its toll on David Irvine's health. I was there the day when he fainted in the assembly and Joe Hendren, the doctor, rushed forward. And I said to him, you need to be more careful after this. Yeah, yeah, he'd say, yeah, yeah. And Jeanette had been begging him to do the same. In January 2007, David suffered a heart attack. He, he, took, he took ill during the night. He went to the bathroom and came back and uh, uh, yeah, that woke me, you know. But you know, I was sitting on the side of the bed and I said, David, what's wrong? He says, uh, I feel really ill. I says, will I get a doctor? He says, no, an ambulance. He'd taken a heart attack on the way over, but he was talking away. I, all I could feel was relief. Oh, thank goodness, he's talking away. So we, we went home, and that's the one thing I regret, going home. And we were called back again. And he was put on a life support machine. Oh. Oh. Terrible. Our words have just fell apart. A family statement said Mr Irvine died peacefully and with dignity at the Royal Victoria Hospital. At just 53, his death has shocked and saddened both friends and adversaries alike. Amongst the many politicians attending the funeral, perhaps the most significant, given the circumstances, was the Sinn Féin leader, Jerry Adams. For us, it was uh, as much about conveying a message to his community. Not to say to validate him, because he didn't need us to validate him, but it, 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 it was demonstrating for, for us, given leadership within our own community, that, you know, in order to achieve peace, you have to do things you might have thought weren't doable beforehand or you might not have thought of doing before. We are really engaged in this very difficult debate on the, um, uh, on the police in particular between the two sides. And to lose Davy at that moment, um, right in, as we're just getting to the last stage of this, was a bit of a tragedy. Given all he'd contributed to it, that he didn't actually live to see the moment when things came to fruition, when we finally had um, Martin McGuinness sitting down with Ian Paisley. I think that was a tragedy. I think David Irvine's legacy is the vision that he had for Northern Ireland. And that was where everyone had their place in the sun. And that meant that the most poor and disadvantaged within our society were able to reach their full potential. That's what he wanted. That's what he wanted for working class areas. It was a sign of hope for the new year, as Catholics and Protestants from West Belfast met for a vigil along the so-called peace line. It was a different place for Northern Ireland, not the sectarian Northern Ireland, not that bitterness, not that place full of hate. Um, he wanted us to coexist, and of course we were going to have our constitutional differences. Both he and I would have had them. Um, but I too, like him, wanted us to settle down here in Northern Ireland to share this place, to coexist, to even do more than coexist, to be friends, you know, in a sense, if we could do it, why couldn't others? Just to see the Union flag and the tricolour together is maybe where this society's going, and if we can use healing through remembrance to get there, why not? He was able to do something that we find dead hard up here in this part of the world. He was able to say, I'm sorry. And, you know, I witnessed that. If somebody stood up and said to him, your organization killed my brother, 
what are you going to do about it? And he got up and he walked over to, to her and uh, he put his hand out and uh, it what seemed like an eternity. It was probably only 10 seconds, but it just seemed like an eternity. No hand was coming back, but he stood there and I thought Manny's a person would say, oh, fuck us. But she got up, shook his hand and he said to her, I'm working night and day, all day, every day. Those words I've always lived. I'm working night and day, all day, every day. I'm working night and day, all day, every day to make sure this never happens again. And it was at that moment I thought, maybe I'm in the presence of somebody a bit special here. He was no saint, by the way. David Irving would take your head up before he'd look at you, but he had that political courage to confront, I suppose, to confront reality. Apologies and regret are a part of the pathway of moving on, but it's got to be more than that. It's got to be actions. We've got to absolutely follow through on that. And sadly, after the loss of David, we haven't seen anybody from that community who can provide that guidance and leadership. But I always admired his sort of, uh, his tenacity, his courage, not forgetting, you know, his organization killed my, my, my mother. And I try to forget that, but I can't forget it. I might forgive it, but I can't forget it. And uh, within a few years, you know, this is why life is precious, he's gone. And when we think of the numbers and calculate the numbers of those who have suffered in our society, we need to think about the victims, we need to think about their families, and we need to think about the, the con constancy of pain that travels through our society every day and, and will never go away in some respects. I absolutely understand how families can feel absolutely enraged uh, because of what has been done to them. I would caution against holding on to that. I think, uh, you know, you've, you've got to find some way of, of freeing yourself from that. But if they don't want to have any respect for David Irving, that's absolutely up to them. Clearly not universally liked within his community for, for the direction he was taking them, but he was doing the right thing. Whether that was part of his uh, rehabilitation, his personal rehabilitation, or, or his, his uh, guilt for what he had done, I don't know, don't care, actually. But he eventually did the right thing. And, uh, and you have to welcome that. One of the things that hasn't happened, although maybe it will happen in Northern Ireland, we've not got past sectarian politics into ideological politics. And I kind of think maybe, David, we would be one of those who would have actually led it in an ideological direction. And I think about the deprivation, the deprivation in loyalist areas. Uh, and I wonder if that's ever going to be solved unless there is an articulate voice for loyalism that's sadly missing at the moment. So I think his legacy was that, to bring loyalists to the table, to help contribute to peace, which will be a lasting peace in Northern Ireland. But he didn't manage, because he didn't live long enough, to actually bring loyalists to the sort of the final stage where they could be part of ordinary politics rather than still being away from the table. He was my wee brother. I loved him. Um, I admired him in the end. I, um, I was proud of the journey that he had made. I was uh, proud of, of the inroads that he had made for peace. And he was crucial to bringing comparative peace to Northern Ireland, and I salute him. God bless him. Well, we all want unbending and unmovable to hold our mantle tight and clear. The difficulty is in a divided society, when you vote for those rigorous politicians, you're voting for a war. There has to be compromise. There has to be accommodation. And yet in Northern Ireland, there are attitudes among our population that are one step away from thinking that agreement is a bad thing. Not just the agreement, but agreement. That's a dangerous concept. And we have to make move heaven and earth and anything else to create an outcome where we get back on the path of the exploration. Nobody told us it was going to be easy. Nobody told us it was going to be easy. David, thank you very much.
I want to thank you all for the overwhelming support on the Trouble Bomb. Please do like and subscribe as it helps us to grow the channels and spread awareness on this terrible conflict. If you haven't already, make sure to check out our second channel, which deviates from mainstream documentaries and delves deeper into personal stories that have arisen from the conflict. Many thanks to all our Patreon members. If you haven't already, please do join for free. The link's in the description.